I want to acknowledge, uh, first of all, some of the sponsors of this presentation. The first is Rockland Trust. Um, Rockland Trust um, is sponsoring a series of webinars for My Pinnacle Network and South Shore Networking Professionals. They um, have banks in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and provide a variety of commercial and individual banking needs. Second sponsor is South Shore Networking Professionals. As I mentioned, they've been around for several years providing networking, typically face-to-face -face networking opportunities uh, throughout the South Shore. They are now collaborating with My Pinnacle Network to create some of the webinars like this one. And then our last sponsor is My Pinnacle Network, uh, which is a business-to-business -business networking group that meets once a month to help people generate introductions for each other. So let me proceed with our presentation. First of all, this photo, which looks a little obscure in relation to podcasting, is to indicate that we have taken our lumps in learning how to podcast. Uh, Joe Duramo and I, who are hosting this event, have, are currently hosting two different podcasts one for PR Works, our main business, about business way outside the box. And the second one is about My Pinnacle Network and tips on better networking techniques for pro professionals. Um, and through a variety of interviews and technology, we have certainly earned our lumps in sort of learning the ropes. Um, I have done a lot of research on podcasting as well. And um, what I can tell you is we may be saving you maybe a decade of your time in this presentation by boiling down to the essentials to potentially getting yourself going. The real challenge in, in uh, podcasting is simply taking the first step and getting better at it as you go. We're going to give you some of the rudiments of how to get started. Joe, you want to respond to that at all? Yes, I can also say that lady podcasting also ha is known for her body blows as well as shots to the face. Thank you, Joe. Uh, one of the things that we want to talk about was podcasting is also about vlogcasting, which means um, it is both audio and video, depending on the opinion of the podcaster. In our case, and we're going to go into more detail about this, we recommend you do both. And one of the things that we try to do for our clients and ourselves is create a real wow beginning of a bumper to those videos to draw people in and to set a tone. And I'm going to show you examples of a couple of these. I hope I didn't scare you at the end. You have to wait for that one. Uh, the next one is our networking group. And lastly, the Chiropractic Society of Rhode Island. Now, the danger of these is sometimes the intro is better than the podcast. So we're working on the podcast part as well. Uh, but you get the sense that part of podcasting is the packaging of the podcast. And, and we encourage uh, folks to pay attention to that. And we help them do that as well. Fast growing medium. Um, at this point, more than half of Americans listen to podcasts. Uh, People are listening to podcasts anywhere from really very slickly produced radio shows like um, things taken from national public radio like This American Life, uh, Car Talk, and so on, to really um, simple podcasts that are done from the offices of people who are trying to build their businesses on a local or regional basis. One of the things I learned in doing my research was that the, um, it is the largest audience for affluent people um, on 
um, for any channel. So if you are trying to reach out to affluent folks, podcasting is a great way to, to do that. Here are some of the numbers to give you the magnitude of podcasting. Um, over a million podcasts are out there. Um, if you listen to podcasts alone, uh, you know that there are dozens of places to find podcasts. Um, and, and within those uh, platforms, there are many, many to choose from. 29 million segments in total have been made thus far. It goes on and on. I'm not going to go into all those details, but you see that it's just this huge explosion of opportunity. Why do people listen? Um, they really listen um, to be educated sometimes. I think that's what most business podcasts are. Business podcasts like ours tend to try to provide useful information to position ourselves as experts. Um, to be the go-to source when somebody is ready to make that decision. Uh, some people listen to podcasts to be inspired, um, and so they're non-business related, although sometimes it's a combination. They want to be entertained or they want companionship. Joe, you want to talk a little bit about that sort of sense of community? Yeah, uh, I know I know from my own personal listening habits, you do feel part of something. Um, I'm a subscriber to the Tuesday People podcast with uh, Mitch Album, And as somebody who's gone through some life experiences recently, it just, it, it's a show about, he talks about his book Tuesdays with Maury and uh, it becomes, um, you know, you're, you're a part of the community and listening to the show, but you're also, well, a lot of these podcasts will have uh, YouTube pages, Facebook pages, uh, groups even. So, you do feel like you're you have people who have a, a similar interest and that's, you know, and, and for, for things like what we do, uh, we're all small business owners and we all are all networkers. So we're trying to develop community of uh, small business and networkers. So it's, it can create that feel to it. And you do feel like you belong to it. And since we're smaller podcasts, they tend to be more responsive. If you want to chime in, send a note, whatever. Um, so it, and, you can see your, your viewpoints reflected in the podcast. So it does create that sense of community. And the final note about companionship is that most podcasts are intended to, to feel like a one-to-one -one communication, that it's very personal, it's very intimate, and you're part of that community, um, you're connected to somebody. So um, one of the real advantages of podcasts are that they are on demand similar to netflix mentality of you can start them when you want you can stop them when you want you can return them to them when you want the ultimate goal of many podcasts is really to have somebody put their smartphone in their pocket and go for a run go for a walk work out uh do housework whatever they're doing and listen to your podcast um and, and uh, be focused on it. One of the things that it, uh, a podcast really allows you to do is be the voice of authority. So you become that credible source, you become more visible, it does create um, leads, um, it helps with search engine optimization, um, you become the cultural authority and um, by just even mentioning that you have a podcast, you've increased your value proposition. Um, it is a powerful tool that is a um, largely a positioning tool in addition to a marketing tool. Uh, where the rubber hits the road for most businesses, they're really looking for cl a client acquisition. And um, podcasts will tend to do that for you that um, from your listeners to your guests, um, it is not uncommon to um, win over new clients. And it's what, uh, from a position of authority um, and it makes the sale easier. Joe, you want to talk a little bit about sort of rubbing elbows with um, potential prospects and having them on as guests? Uh, well, I mean, it's just, it's... <laughs> 
it gives a chance uh, for you to kind of demonstrate the power of, of it when you have a prospect on your show. They, because there's far more, um, it, it, it goes beyond just being on a show. There's all sorts of promotion that goes on with the podcast itself. There's also um, the presentation of the podcast. So, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but in terms of uh, posting it to um, a, a platform like YouTube or posting to a platform like Anchor, iTunes, et cetera, you're also creating essentially a landing page where you talk about that client's um, or that prospect's business, you put their website in it, and they see firsthand the power of it. And it's it's very quite compelling. And the other thing that becomes quite apparent to them is that there's a lot more to it than they might think. And it's something that, you know, they might want to farm out to us. I mean, that's one of the reasons we do it. It's, it's something that becomes a, appealing to pro They want to do it, but they know, okay, maybe we need some help with this. Okay. Thanks, Joe. So some people get into podcasting because they think they're going to be the next Joe Rogan. And right now there's only one Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan recently um, just signed a multi-million dollar deal for his podcast and he's done very well. He's also known for very long podcasts, which is unusual as well. But there are lots of other ways to monetize your podcast. Um, and these are some of them, I should say Patreon, affiliate marketing, there's um, AdSense is a, a service online or you could be selling your own books, products, training, services, your swag. Uh, but I think that um, it sort of reminds me of the early days of uh, blogging when everyone thought they would create a blog and the world would, would run to them and, and it would create um, their next great new opportunity. In reality, um, the riches come later as you have really a significant audience, a large audience, multi-thousands. And for the most, most of the folks that we're talking to are looking to create business-related podcasts that really serve a niche and generate their riches are finding new clients and positioning themselves as the authority. So, one of the debates in the podcasting world is, do you do video or audio? Uh, in our case, we had some discussion and we decided for several reasons that we should do both. We do video because YouTube is the largest search engine, second largest search engine to Google. And uh, we do audio because it's for all those folks that would rather consume the information in their car or some other place. And um, so we do both. And we, we tend to repurpose that file uh, for both purposes, both audio and video. So we use Zoom uh, for ours. You, you certainly could go into a studio and record your podcast when we have resources to do that, but we find most people, both in terms of the host of the podcast and the guests are far too busy to, to run around uh, and, and get to uh, a standard location. Nowadays, almost everything is done either on hardline phone or via Zoom. We use Zoom because it gives us both audio and video. Um, and we are able to get the MP3 and the MP4 files from Zoom almost immediately after the broadcast is done. Joe, you want to talk a little bit about those files? Uh, yeah, like Steve said, uh, at the end of the Zoom cast, uh, you, well, you can record your Zoom um, meeting or podcast. And that's sort of how this started. And it it comes in two formats, an MP4, MP3, and um, it basically you you store them in the cloud, so it's not taking up room on your hard drive. You download it when you're done. You get an email from Zoom saying your recordings are ready, 
And typically I don't even need the um, MP3 because the platform we use to upload for audio anchor will remove the video components. So they, they couldn't make it easier to create the actual, the footage. I mean, we still have to do the other production work, but the footage itself is created by Zoom and, and it couldn't be easier. Um, and the, only foot, and the only footnote here is that you're sort of at the mercy of your internet connection and, and, and um, the vagaries of technology. And so uh, I did a podcast, um, a really interesting podcast from the standpoint of the guest was Mark Parrish from, from Crescent Ridge Dairy. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the video on my side was digitized. My face came off as sort of one of those glitchy things and um, it occasionally happens but not all that all that often and the beauty of that is it is you know people aren't listening to you not necessarily there to see you although that's kind of a part of the community and the companionship end of it but we were simply able to use the audio podcast and put it out the other day and it you know it, you, you've got a back you got a plan b i guess if stuff like that happens and that's the advantage to doing both So, um, as you know, YouTube is just um, a, a treasure trove of information and it is a go-to place. It is worth creating a YouTube channel. That is part of what we do um, when we build a podcast. Uh, and it's one of the other assets that, that the podcaster gets is they're found in a critical place like YouTube. So the first question you have to really ask about um, creating a podcast is what is your theme? What's going to make it stand out? What's going to make it unique? What is going to draw an audience and hold an audience? And so that's about relevance, passion, and why are you passionate about the topic? And is it unique enough um, to stand apart from um, everything that's already out there. And if you look to the right, um, we give some of the examples of the podcasts that we are involved with. Um, the one that I thought was, uh, that we had to really um, dig deep and, and discuss was our own, which really is about marketing, but we tend to, to attract clients that are unusual and they, their, their clients like New England Burial at Sea or Boot Camp for New Dads that have great stories to tell. They're not quite sure how to get their arms around them um, or how to get them to the right audiences. And that's what we're pretty good about. And so it made sense to have a podcast about really unusual businesses or businesses that deliver their services in unusual ways. Um, and then just as... A second uh, example, Seniors First podcast is really about how to get ready to retire um, anywhere from financially to um, having all the other structures in your life um, managed so that you can enjoy a better retirement. Joe, anything else on theme in terms of creating something that is uh, compelling? Yeah, I think um, you know, it, it was it was funny because I, I'm trying to recall that if we had any conversations before you actually did your first podcast with Brad, Captain White, and it really when when you you sent me the video, I don't I don't even remember it, but I remember you sent me the video, and I was like, wow, it, this is this is pretty awesome. Um, that you know, this is we're onto something here because. We do work with a lot of kind of businesses that have a different approach or a different concept. And I think that's really the key and also kind of striking up and also talking to other folks. I mean, we can get on and do a monologue, but folks generally don't want to hear us after, I don't know, Steve is more, far more interesting than me, but uh, folks generally tune out after a while. So having guests, I think, is another approach to uh, the podcast that makes it work. You can have a different theme each week and be the sole voice, but it's it's 
having a second voice in a dialogue really makes a difference in coming up with a podcast that will keep people coming back. Okay, thanks. And we're going to get to that of the types of podcasts you can have, the different approaches to podcasting um, as well. So next issue is how do you name your podcast? Uh, the name um, is often how people are going to find you in their search on podcast platforms. Um, the name needs to be both enticing and somewhat descriptive of what you do. So how do you create that? And I give you a sort of a checklist of things to think about. Um, keyword rich is a good example. Um, what are the words that you're gonna use that can be found in a simple keyword search or, or phrase of words? Um, is it memorable? And then one of the places to look to see if podcast names are taken is instant domain search. Cause oftentimes uh, when you start a podcast, you're going to create a, a, a website for it, or you're going to create a landing page within your existing business website for that podcast. Uh, we also do go Google searches for um, names that we're thinking about. So for ex example, the Chiropractic Society of Rhode Island, uh, we came up with a bunch of names about um, backs, back to the future, uh, we've got your back. Um, it went on and on of the play on words related to their profession. And we found most of those were taken or uh, almost all of those were taken. And one that was not was get a spine. And um, it just, it works. The host who's a chiropractic doctor loves saying get a spine to introduce the show. And um, it's a good example of uh, getting close to um, capturing the spirit of a show and making it findable and memorable. Here are some of the naming no-nos. Uh, don't outdo yourself. Um, I think some shows try to get too cute or too obscure um, and then it becomes an inside joke to them and their colleagues as opposed to the audience they may be reaching. So um, don't, uh, don't be too clever. All right, the next part uh, that I see um, discussed in podcasting is oftentimes far too much consideration of the equipment. Um, if you've done any research on your own or if you're an audiophile, you probably know what a pop filter is. It's a little filter that goes on top of a mic that sort of takes away the popping sound of a P. Um, there are boom mics so that you can hang the mic from the ceiling so it's sort of directly in front of you. Um, but most of that equipment discussion is cause for delay of getting your podcast going. Really all you need is as you can see on the left, a simple headset is, a, is usually enough to uh, have decent sound quality. Um, I also happen to have a Blue Yeti. The problem with a Blue Yeti is that it's a condenser mic, which means that it picks up sound from all sides. And if you're in a, um, a, a many environments um, sound echoey and pick up every sound, um, that can be a problem. And so, um, what I tend to do is I tend to plug my headset into my Yeti and then uh, use the best of those to combine. Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't need a soundboard. You don't need lots of equipment to get started. At some point, when you go uh, up the food chain, you may add those things. Next part. Uh, that's important, especially uh, obviously on the video side is the lighting. So we've all been on Zoom calls in general where somebody looks like they're either in a haunted house or they're on the face of the sun or they're on the dark side of the moon. But whatever it is, it's scaring us and it doesn't work well and it's distracting. And this video, this uh, graphic shows you um, sort of the best setup in lighting, which is um, 
the camera sits right in front of you, very close, so that you're largely filling up the frame. Uh, you have lights on the left and right of you, and you have a light right behind you as well, so that it's, uh, it's making sure that your face is lit and it's blocking out some of the shadows from behind. But um, it, some of this can be achieved with simple um, table lamps. Um, that's what I use. I've got two table lamps on my left and right and some um, fluorescent light behind on top of me and sunlight to the right. Um, and I tend to be fairly well lit. But it's something to consider. Um, and it doesn't and, and it doesn't have to be costly. Editing. So a lot of new podcasters get stuck on um, the the challenges of editing and making sure that their podcast is is uh, word perfect. There are a number of um, inexpensive or free editing tools that are relatively user friendly. Joe, you do uh, the engineering for our podcast. You want to talk a little bit about Camtasia, which you use? Yeah, Camtasia is a, a video uh, based production um, soft software. It's on. It's a web based, so it's not on your hard drive. Um, Basically, it enables you to put in the bumpers, the uh, audio to do edits, small edits here and there. Um, it's, it's so you can basically take care of the video and audio at the same time, and then you can uh, share that to your Google hard to your Google Drive. So, say you don't want to store things on your um, on your hard drive or your computer. So, it's fairly straightforward to use. That is a few hundred box to use. It's relatively affordable. Um, the software, but if, if say you're just doing a straight, straightforward uh, audio podcast, you can use Anchor. Anchor is free. It enables you to record on it, on it as well and do some editing. So you, if, if you have a lot of uhs and the, you know some glitches here and there, you can edit those out. So you have a range of tools if you want to start a podcast from free to a few hundred bucks and um, Camtasia does have a 30 day trial so that you could try it out and see if you're comfortable working with it. Um, it has a lot of tutorials so you can teach yourself how to do the intros and outros. So um, I think if, if you're committed to doing a, a podcast or a vlogcast, I think it's a good investment uh, for a few hundred dollars and you, you can get up to speed fairly quickly. Okay, thanks, Joe. And let me know if there's any questions that are filtering in via the chat. Uh, there are, have been some questions, but I, I was saying maybe we should take them after as opposed okay. to get off, off topic, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Good. Thank right. you for letting me know. Okay, so the four, here are the four general formats that podcasts tend to take. The interview format, um, which we like because, uh, as Joe said, I, I a monologue, unless you are um, a trained actor or someone who's extremely dynamic, a monologue can get old really fast. Interviews allow for some real give and take and um, diversity of comment and sound and sight. Um, and uh, we find them to be the most popular um, of the four formats. The next one is expert, which is really what I just talked about, which is someone who is pontificating about um, a subject that they are very comfortable with and adding great detail to. Current events um, tend to be, as, as noted to the right, tech, business, sports. Um, uh, there's lots of um, really niche, you know, minor league sport post-game discussions to uh, the technology of, uh, you know, healthcare benefits. Um, they can be very niche or they can be general about uh, specific uh, subjects. And then Q&A um, can be um, a question of the week or the month for um, a specific industry. One of the places to go to find some of the sort of 
major questions that people are asking back and forth are Quora, if you want to um, borrow from their repository of things that people are already interested in and talking about. <clears throat> so the challenge of doing actually recording the podcast is obviously quiet is key. Um, so, uh, you know, you need ground rules if you're doing it at home. You even need ground rules if you're doing it at the office to make sure that um, all the noise that is outside stays outside. Uh, many podcasters talk about if they're doing a solo podcast, a monologue, they will record in their closet. Uh, I am not, I'm not coming out of my closet or going into my closet. I do mine from my office and it's uh, fairly tight and the sound is fairly good. Uh, but it is worth noting uh, that you really wanna set the stage for an environment that you can control. Turn off your phones, turn off anything that's gonna make a sound to be interrupted. The second, I always have to have a cameo appearance in, in all of uh, my presentations. Uh, I suggest that you uh, put on your camera beforehand before you get, get anywhere close to recording and see what the background looks like. Make sure that um, the screen is close enough to you so that you're largely filling up the screen. And, um, and I like to show my Yeti mic so that uh, people know that I'm fairly serious about podcasting and I invest in it as well. And I'm concerned about the sound. Platforms, um, Joe mentioned, and we're going to go into a little bit more about Anchor. We happen to use Anchor as our one of our podcast platforms, but um, there are quite a few. This screen shows you some of the more popular places um, where you can create your own podcast. It's sort of a one-stop platform that... Um, you can use it to record, you can use it to edit, you can also use it to upload to some of the major podcast uh, websites. And um, most of them have, uh, are free for low end usage. Um, and then uh, pricing starts to escalate as you hit increase in uh, downloads and listenership and how you use it. As I mentioned, we're really not selling Anchor. We just happen to use it. It happens to be, after some research, uh, one of the better resources out there. Joe, you want to talk a little bit about why we chose Anchor? Uh, ease of use was huge. Um, cost necessarily wasn't a factor. We were just looking for something that was effective, but it also happens to be free. The best part, I think, is that when you upload to Anchor, that it also will push it out to a number of other uh, platforms as well. Spotify being one of the more significant ones. And uh, uh, each podcast we have on Anchor is picked up by Spotify and a bunch of other things like Google Podcasts and Radio Public and some others. Uh, Google also offers a manual uh, upload as well so that if you have an iTunes account, you can upload to iTunes. So that's another thing a lot of people like to be on iTunes. So it, it really, um, it all, also the, the, what, what I like about Anchor is it does give you a lot of room for show notes. So you, like I said, mentioned earlier, you can basically create kind of a landing page for your podcast where you have a, a description of the show. You can talk about your guest or your company, whichever, or both actually. And what you can have uh, links to your website, links to your guest website, um, each anchor podcast, each episode will have its own uh, URL that you can share. It makes it quite easy to share to your social media. That's part of your anchor account is you, when you set up your podcast, you can knock things out to your social media channels quite easily. So as you can tell, there's a lot of reasons why I, why I like anchor and cost is a great benefit too. And it, it does make it easy if someday your podcast does get to a point where you have sponsors that you can put in little ads and things like that 
within your uh, podcast. So it, it really is a great tool. Thank you. So the next discussion is segment length. What is the perfect length? And there are lots of opinions on that. Um, the standard most accepted um, point of view is that it should be the average commute length, which when, remember we used to commute to offices um, and that average commute is 27 minutes. And the theory is that people prefer if possible to have completion of their podcast. They'd rather hear the whole thing than stop it and start it later if possible. So 27 minutes is your average audio. Video tends to be shorter. If you were just doing a video podcast, um, there are some theories that video should be literally five minutes or less. So, um, but we tend to go over that. We tend to use um, both, as we mentioned, both the audio and the video from Zoom. And most of our podcasts come in about 15 minutes, which we feel is uh, brief enough to hold someone's attention uh, and not overstay our welcome. So one of the challenges for most people is booking guests. Now you'd think people would um, trample your door to be on your podcast because it's an opportunity for them to have some, some limelight. But um, the challenge is getting those people organized, getting them booked, having them arrive uh, on time, being prepared. Uh, it's, it's more than you'd think. And so this is our checklist for getting guests um, organized. So we give them the specific topic. We talk about the time frame. We give them some options for dates. We don't leave it open-ended because um, that puts them into analysis paralysis. Uh, we give them some sample questions that we tend to use on our podcasts, uh, but we encourage them to provide us with additional questions as well if they'd like. We send them a link to past shows so they can see what it's like. And we even send them some tips on how to make sure they look and sound good on Zoom. And we find that by sending them this pre-taping um, package, it gets them organized, it get, gets them in the right make, uh, frame of mind that um, they should be prepared and it's a more serious endeavor than just showing up and winging it. And, um, and oftentimes this is where you're gonna even establish rapport with your guest by sharing this information back and forth. Um, Joe, booking guests, any comments on that? The challenges, uh, the amount of time invested? Yeah, I mean, it really is something. It's, um, you, you do have to do some legwork um, in terms of making sure they're available. Uh, one of the beauties of the podcast format is that you, um, you can do it anytime so you're not stuck to a slot. Like our show doesn't, our, our Steve's podcast, the you know business way outside the box. That's anytime he can make it work for the the guests. So that's the beauty of it. But you still do need to do some legwork. Make sure they can do it. Make sure they're um, in a place where they can can do the interview. Where it's again, they'll need a quiet space with good lighting. They'll need a headset, um, and they also they also need to be prepped. And one you want to submit some sample questions to them. Make sure they know what you're going to ask and it's probably not a bad idea before each before you actually turn the record on to frame everything and then just kind of run through the questions and you know what type of uh, answers you might get to the questions similar to like what johnny carson used to do that's how he used to prep his guests so they would have funny one-liners when they would come out so um that's all part of the 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 legwork and it, it, it you know it's not something you can do just say oh it's going to take me 20 minutes to do that because you're communicating with somebody and it depends on when they get back to and vice versa. So you do have to budget a little time for that. Quick question. Who's Johnny Carson? Most of us are too young to know that. Um, Just kidding. I've, I've seen the guest list. I think everybody knows. <laughs> okay. Uh, booking guests info needed. Here's what we usually ask them for in return. 
is their bio or their CV or their resume, whatever they can send us. Sometimes that's just simply uh, their LinkedIn um, uh, URL so we can get some detail on them. We want to have a headshot so we can uh, use that to promote the episode and some of our social media. We want their social media addresses and we want to know if they have anything that they can give away on the podcast, whether that's a free book or ebook or or a uh, an audit of some aspect of their business, whatever it might be. Um, but we want to make sure that they are participating and provide us with ample information um, so that we can maximize the opportunity. One of the things that we also recommend and, and emphasize to our guests uh, and our hosts is that this podcasting is you really about storytelling no one came on to have a a uh, a lecture from a college professor about a topic uh, where they're giving you more detail than you can uh, assimilate at one time it's really about storytelling that engages people that um, really underscores the topic and um and it becomes a pleasure to listen to. Um, and one of the quotes I heard that I liked was, data connects heads, story connects hearts. And so uh, we encourage guests to think about stories they can tell related to what they do that really give us a good illustration um, uh, that we can relate to. And then we do a lot of guest reminders. So, um, you know, even though when we're sending them a Zoom invitation, um, most people ha are able to have that um, filter into their calendar. Not everybody can do that. And even, in, in, even if it's in their calendar, they need reminders. And we remind them both the week of and the day of to make sure that they, they, they arrive on time. So introducing your guest, one of, the, one of the keys of podcasting is doing a good job by um, helping your guest be the best guest they could be. Um, and part of that is doing your homework on them. Do a Google search, take a look at them on LinkedIn, uh, read their book if you have it, do everything you can so that there is a more natural flow to that conversation um, and uh, the audience can tell when you've done your homework and it makes for a much better podcast. So then the next part, uh, you know, part of being a host is it is um, getting better as you do it. Almost everything um, as you do it, you're going to get better. Um, I had some real trouble uh, being overly casual, being not enthusiastic enough, not doing enough research. Um, and and um, I've learned that the best way to, to really introduce a guest and to get off to a good start is to do my research and then provide some highlights of my guests, um, edify them of um, explaining why they are worth listening to and the experienced person that they are. Start by offering um, their plug for whatever it is that they might be um, selling uh, without being overly salesy. And uh, lastly, I will mention their name. So the way to really do it is to talk about your guest and then the last thing is say, and let me introduce you to our guest today, Joe Durama. And um, if you follow um, any talk shows, you'll see that's the way it's done. And it's done that way for a reason, because it's the best way to keep the audience um, um, informed and involved. So you don't want to relinquishing the controls are an example. And I've been uh, guilty of this in, in the past and at the very beginning of podcasting, which was, I would say, and Joe, um, I could describe you and give some of the highlights of your background, but I think I would do it injustice. Why don't you introduce yourself? And then Joe's off to the races and it, and it really indicates, A, I haven't 
done my research. I'm not bold enough to to highlight what I think is most important about Joe's background. And and then Joe could people can ramble on for half an hour about their background and that's dangerous as well. So you don't want to um, hand it over for that to them for their own description. So part of uh, the reason people come on to your podcast is often to plug their business or their product or their service. Um, and uh, those plugs um, should be at the very beginning of the podcast, somewhere in the middle and somewhere at the end. And the reason you do that is not only is repetition part of marketing, but you know, people fade in and fade out of podcasts and you want to make sure that um, you're trying to give the host, I'm sorry, the guest as much opportunity as possible. Um, when I say here, no Irish goodbyes, um, you know, many people who are listening to a podcast, um, we'll sneak away uh, without obviously bidding adieu. Uh, you want to make sure you get your message in beforehand before they leave. So how do you start a podcast after the introduction? Uh, I think it is um, almost necessary because of the companionship of podcasting and the intimacy to start with some small talk before you launch right into the key topic. And so it is something else that's topical about what they're doing, which is, it could be a new project, it could be some recent travel you know they've done, um, or a current event that's impacting them, could be anywhere from COVID-19 to um, a heat wave to um, they've been nominated for an Emmy. But uh, it makes sense to have some small talk to get started. Joe, I think you do a good job of making guests comfortable. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think the, the big part, the key I do is I basically make some sort of disparaging remark about their ancestry, and that tends to lighten the mood. I'm, I'm kidding, obviously, but um, I, I think making guests feel comfortable, a big part of it is... Uh, kind of giving, giving them questions in advance and then doing like a little run through about, you know, the possible answers. And, um, you know, when you're smaller like this, um, you tend to know more about your, a lot more about your guests. Like we've had people we've networked with on our shows or people have been clients. So we know a lot about them. And I think a lot of times, and, and, and this speaks to what Steve was talking about in terms of doing your research. Um, Sometimes you'll know, know things, you'll find things interesting about a guest that they might not think is that interesting themselves. So doing the little pre, you know, whether it's a phone call before the show or whether it's before you record, I think it's key just to, to and to let them know that, hey, this is, you know, uh, this is kind of interesting. Do you have any stories about that or, or whatnot? So yeah, that's, that's kind of been my approach is that just to, to get, have a, have a conversation before the show in before. Even, and before you even book the show, just what you, you know, things that you talk about, I think is key. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Steve, I, I, I want to keep all questions to the end, but this one kind of yep. needed some clarification as to what exactly is an Irish goodbye. Ah, the, I, so there's a, there's a saying that the Yiddish say goodbye but never leave, and the Irish uh, leave without saying goodbye. So there you go. I hope that explains it. If you don't, if you don't get it, email me. <laughs> I'll give you more detail. Or, or just come to one of my barbecues. You'll see it happen on both sides. Um, okay. Uh, so where, one of the things that we want um, to do with guests is obviously where can we find you so we give their URLs and their social. Um, we also want to, uh, on, on any podcast, you want to make sure that you encourage people um, to subscribe to your YouTube channel or follow you on whatever platform they are listening on. So you want to have them click those buttons so they're alerted of future episodes. That's an important call to action towards the end of a podcast. And then promotion. Um, I'm going to skip over this promotion 
um, section fairly quickly because we don't have a lot of time left, but part of podcasting is promoting the podcast. And um, there's a fair amount of uh, devil in the details here, but show notes are all the uh, descriptive narrative that you're able to put to that podcast um, and post to the various podcast portals that describe the show, uh, the specific segment of the show, and some of the details that people will hear. Some of those show notes are searchable, and so those keywords and phrases are important as well. Um, we do some of these other promotional things like news releases around podcasting, media relations to get um, the press to talk about it. Uh, we do a lot of social media to promote shows as well. We recommend you do the same. And then monetizing, again, there are a lot of different options here. Um, I think, as I say in the second line here, it's too soon to really um, concern yourself with monetizing, but you should plan for it. That you're thinking about long-term, how, how could I possibly find sponsors, affiliates, um, ways to make revenue from this um, and to enhance uh, its credibility. And so that sort of brings us to the end of our presentation. One of the things that we offer is anyone who wants a 15 minute consult about, you know, how, what, what would make sense for their theme, for their podcast, the name, and some of the logistics, we'd be happy to talk with you. Um, and that's our contact information. Um, Joe, do we have time for a couple questions um, now? Um, sure. Um... I wanted to know how you wanted to handle questions, whether we could uh, take down the presentation and see who's talking or uh, unmute them, or we could just, uh, I could just give you the questions and we could answer and kind of, it might be shorter if we do it, just I'll ask the questions. Yeah, then. go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, we, we did have one question about why Zoom and why not Facebook Live? And um, I can take that one if yeah, you like. Um, it's just... Um, you have more options with Zoom in that you, Facebook Live kind of limits you to Facebook and whether or not your audience has a Facebook account, whether they can view both the live broadcast and when it's a link on Facebook. So I, I think Zoom just kind of gives you a lot more options and uh, you can convert it. As I mentioned earlier, you can convert it easily into an audio podcast on Anchor and distribute it that way. So that that's my answer to that. Unless, do you have something to add, Steve? Or you no, I think the reason we use Zoom is because um, it takes the stress out of the interview for everybody, that almost everybody is familiar with Zoom and, uh, and it doesn't become um, a barrier. Right. Uh, we had a couple people ask a question, do you own the content when you use Anchor? And I, I can't say 100% I know the answer to that, but... I view Anchor similarly to uh, how we use, uh, as a public relations agency, we use some uh, distribution sites where we'll post our press releases and then um, media outlets will come in and check those out and some will, will take that content and use it on their own site. I see that Anchor's uh, as very similar. So I do think you own the content, but you can't necessarily stop other people from taking the content and putting it on their outlet if they want to share the link. So it's, it's, it's almost like a social media type of page where you're pushing out the content for others to then share or use that way. I think it's a really good description, Joe. I think you nailed it. Um, another question we had uh, was, do you recommend camera software? And um, I think this is from Bill Coyne. Bill, I think you know the answer to that better than I do. If, I think if it works for, your particular purpose, uh, yes. Uh, if you have a reasonably new uh, new computer, your webcam should be fine. If it it may not be, so I, I would say you know explore whatever works. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see a uh, lot of people on Zoom meetings where they're just they're just dark, and that's right. the way I was until I figured out that there was actually a setting on the software with my webcam that would get rid of that, so. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, and some people have outdated webcams built into their laptops and you can buy an external HD camera 
that clips onto your laptop or computer for, you know, you can get a, a good one for $50, $50 or less. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Bill. That's uh, an issue for a lot of folks I know. Um, another question was, do you recommend a, a precast Zoom or would you do a live podcast? Um, Steve, you want to take that? Yeah, I, I think live for my purposes, I, I can understand how some people, it, a webinar is different than uh, a podcast. I think podcasts make it makes more sense to tape them, um, and you distribute them when you want. Um, but there may be cases where you're you're at a, a a conference or a symposium and you want to do some things live. There are different reasons for uh, the two the two different uh, options. Uh, this this question is really interesting, and as a guy who a longtime media veteran, I think Steve is the best one to answer this one too as well. How do you get a guest to stop talking to move, so you can move on to your next question, which okay. it's a good example of me just asking this question too long and Steve wanting to jump in and, and say something. So. Yeah. I think uh, it's always a challenge when you have people who are loquacious to, to give them focus and direction. And oftentimes, as they hear you're trying to break in, they, they get that verbal cue. And, um, and I often try to make it a positive interruption by saying, that's really interesting. I want to get back to some other key points and then you redirect them. But right, you don't want to lose control of an interview because uh, most people will tend to ramble um, and, and they go, um, to areas that are less interesting than potentially the audience um, at hand. Another benefit to doing this via Zoom is that you are able to see the person you're talking to. And if it's just the two of you on the screen, I mean, there are all sorts of uh, visual cues you can have where you, may, you might hold up a note card and just kind of be reading and then they'll, they'll say, okay, he's got another question to go to. So. I think that that technique can work as well. And, and Joe, I don't want to overstay our welcome here. We had talked about closing at 930. Can we take maybe one more question and then whatever's left of questions, if there are, we can respond offline. Uh, that was actually the last question oh, I okay. saw. So um, I, I think uh, one of the things I wanted to do, and since we have the screen share on, I can't do it, but I will do it in our follow-up email was uh, give you some links to our podcasts. And uh, we talked about the, uh, the podcast offering PR Works has. We have a, a web page that describes that a little bit and what you would get. So I can uh, share that with you uh, in a wrap up email. And we've actually uh, been um, recording this as well. And uh, we can share that as well if you're interested in seeing that. and. Uh, that's pretty much all I've got on this end, Steve. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, who's joined us today. Uh, I look forward to your, your emailed comments. Um, I'm happy to uh, give you some um, customized personal insight into your own podcast opportunities. And uh, I look forward to sharing uh, future podcast tips with you as well. So thank you for attending. We will uh, talk down the road, I hope. Thank Thanks you, so much, Steve and Joe. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Bye. very much.